Chapter Eleven of Kabumpo in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Eleven: The King of the Illumi Nation. While Ruggedo was working all this mischief in the Emerald City, Pompadour and the elegant elephant had fallen into strange company. After the prince's disappearance, Kabumpo stared long and anxiously at the white marble stone with its mysterious inscription, Knock before you fall in. What would happen if he knocked, as the sign directed? Something upsetting, the elegant elephant was sure, else why had Pompa called for help? Kabumpo groaned, for he was a luxurious beast, and hated discomfort of any sort. As for falling in, the very thought of it made him shudder in every pound. But selfish and luxurious though he was, the elegant elephant loved Pompa with all his heart. After all, he had run off with the prince and was responsible for his safety. If Pompa had fallen in, he must fall in too. With a resigned sigh, Kabumpo felt in his pocket to see that his treasures were safe, straightened his robe, and taking one last long breath, rapped sharply on the marble stone with his trunk. Without a sound, the stone swung inward, and as Kabumpo was standing on it, he shot headlong into a great black opening. There was a terrific rush of air, and the slab swung back, catching as it did so the fluttering edge of the elegant elephant's robe of state. This halted his fall for about a second, and then with a spluttering tear the silk fringe ripped loose and down plunged the elegant elephant, trunk over heels. After the third somersault, Kabumpo, right side up fortunately, struck a soft inclined slide, down which he shot like a scenic railway train. Great grump, coughed Kabumpo, holding his jeweled headpiece with his trunk. Great before he reached the second grump, his head struck the top of the passage with terrific force, and that was the last he remembered about his fall. How long he lay in an unconscious state, the elegant elephant never knew. After what seemed several ages, he became aware of a confused murmur. Footsteps seemed to be pattering all around him, but he was still too stunned to be curious. Nothing will make me get up, thought Kabumpo dully. I'm going to lie here forever and ever and ever, and just as he reached this drowsy conclusion, something red-hot fell down his neck, and a voice louder than all the rest shouted in his ear, What are you? Ouch! screamed Kabumpo, now thoroughly aroused. He opened one eye and rolled over on his side. A tall, curious creature was bending over him. Its head was on fire, and as Kabumpo blinked angrily, another red-hot shower spattered into his ear. With a trumpet of rage, Kabumpo lunged to his feet. The hot-headed person fell over backwards, and a crowd of similar creatures pattered off into the corner and regarded Kabumpo uneasily. They were as tall as Pompa, but very thin and tube-like in shape, and their heads appeared to be a mass of flickering flames. Like giant candles, reflected the elegant elephant, his curiosity getting the better of his anger. He glanced about hurriedly. He was in a huge white-tiled chamber, and the only lights came from the heads of its singular occupants. A little distance away, Prince Pompadour sat rubbing first his knees and then his head. "'It's another faller,' said one of the giant candlemen to the other. Two fallers in one day. This is exciting. An ouch it calls itself.' "'I don't care what it calls itself,' answered the second candleman crossly. "'I call it mighty rude. How dare you blow out our king?' shouted the hot-headed fellow, shaking his fist at the elegant elephant. "'Here, some of you light him up!' "'Blow out your king?' 
gasped Kabumpo in amazement. Sure enough, he had. There at his feet lay the king of the candles, stiff and lifeless, and with never a head to bless himself with. While the elegant elephant stared at the long candlestick figure, a fat little candleman rushed forward and lit with his own head the small black wick sticking out of the king's collar. Instantly the ruddy flame face of the king appeared, his eyes snapping dangerously. Jumping to his feet he advanced toward Pompadour. "'Is this your ouch?' spluttered the king, jerking his thumb at Kabumpo. "'You must take him away at once. "'I never was so put out in my life. "'Me, the hand-dipped king of the whole Illumi nation, "'to be blown out by a bumpy creature without any headlight. "'Where's your headlight?' he demanded fiercely, "'leaning over the prince and dropping hot tallow down his neck. "'Pompa jumped up in a hurry and backed toward Kabumpo. "'Be careful how you talk to him,' roared the elegant elephant, swaying backwards and forward like a big ship. "'He's a prince, the prince of Pumperdink,' Kabumpo tossed his trunk threateningly. "'A prince?' spluttered the king, changing his tone instantly. "'Well, that's different. A prince can fall in on us any time and welcome, but an ouch? Why bring this great clumsy ouch along?' He rolled his eyes mournfully at Kabumpo. "'He's not an ouch,' explained Pompa, who was gradually recovering from the shock of his fall. "'He is Kabumpo, an elegant elephant, and he blew you out by mistake, didn't you, Kabumpo?' "'Purely an accident, nothing intentional, I assure you,' chuckled Kabumpo. He was beginning to enjoy himself. "'If there's any more trouble, I'll blow em all out,' he reflected comfortably, "'for they're nothing but great big candles.' Seeing their king in friendly conversation with the strangers, the other candlemen came closer, too close for comfort, in fact. They were always leaning over and dropping hot tallow on a body, and the heat from their flaming heads was simply suffocating.' "'Sing the national air for them,' said the Candle King carelessly, and the candlemen, in their queer crackling voices, sang the following song, swaying rhythmically to the tune. "'Flicker, flicker, candlemen, cheer our king and cheer again, neat as wax and always bright, cheers the king of candle light. Kindle lightly, windle slightly, here we burn both day and nightly.' here we have good times to burn till each one goes out in turn thank you said pompa mopping his head with his silk handkerchief thank you very much kabumpo groaned plaintively for the great elephant was nearly stifled how is it you are so tall and thin asked pompa after an awkward pause how is it you are so short and lumpy and unevenly dipped responded king cheer promptly if I were in your place, he gave Kabumpo a contemptuous glance, I'd have myself re-dipped. Where are your wicks, and how can you walk about without being lighted? We're not fireworks, puffed Kabumpo indignantly, and then he gave a shrill scream. Ten candlemen tottered and went out, falling to the ground with a great clatter. Then Pompa leaped several feet in the air, and his scream put out five more. Stop! cried King Cheer angrily. Stand where you are! But Kabumpo and Pompa neither stopped nor stood where they were. The elegant elephant rushed over to the prince and threw his heavy robe over his head, and just in time, for Pompa's golden locks were a mass of flames. Then the prince tore off his velvet jacket and clapped it to Kabumpo's tail, which also was blazing merrily. Great! Grump, rumbled the elegant elephant furiously, when he had extinguished Pompa, and Pompa had extinguished him. I'll put you all out for this. He raised his trunk and pointed it straight at the candleman, who cowered in the far corner. I was only trying to light you up, wailed a little fellow, holding out his hands pleadingly. I thought that was your wick, he pointed a trembling finger at Kabumpo's tail, and another at Pompa's head. 
Wick, snorted Kabumpo in a rage, while the prince ran his hand sorrowfully through his once luxuriant pompadour, of which nothing but a short stubble remained. Wick, what would we be doing with Wicks? I don't think he meant any harm, put in Pompadour, whose heart was touched by the little candleman's terror, and it wouldn't help us any. Thought it was my wick, shrilled Kumbumpo, glancing over his shoulder at his poor scorched tail. He's a wicked little wretch. He's ruined your looks. I know, Pompa sighed dismally. No one will want to marry me now. It's all come true, Kabumpo, just as counted up said, remember? If a thin prince sets out on a fat elephant to find a proper princess, how many yards of fringe will the elephant lose from his robe, and how bald will the prince be at the end of the journey? And we've scarcely begun. Great haystacks, whistled Kabumpo, his little eyes twinkling. So I have lost every bit of fringe from my robe, and my tail, and half the back of my robe besides. This is nice, I must say. We only tried to give you a warm welcome, said the king timidly. Warm welcome? Well, I should think you did, sniffed Kabumpo. How do we get out of here? Oh, that's very simple, said the king, cheering up. Tommy, go for the snuffer. Before Kabumpo or Pompa realized what this would mean, a little candleman named Tommy Tallow had returned with a tall black candle person. He stepped to the side wall, quickly jerked a rope, and down over Kabumpo dropped a great brass snuffer, and over the prince another. That ought to put the cross old things out, Pompa heard the king say, just before his snuffer reached the floor. This is terrible, fumed the poor prince, thumping on the sides of the huge brass dome. I might as well have stayed at home and disappeared comfortably. My poor old father and my mother, I wonder where they are now. Sunk in gloomy reflection, Pompadour leaned against the side of the snuffer, and one cannot blame him for feeling dismal. The fall down the deep passage, the shock of losing his hair, and now imprisonment under a stifling brass dome, were enough to extinguish the hopes of the stoutest-hearted adventurer. "'I shall never find a proper princess,' wailed Pompa, tying and untying his handkerchief. But just then there was a creak from without, and the great dome lifted as suddenly as it had fallen, so suddenly, in fact, that Pompa fell flat on his back. There stood Kabumpo, winding up the long rope with his trunk, and grumbling furiously all the while. "'Takes more than a snuffer to keep me down,' wheezed the elegant elephant, hurrying over and jerking the prince to his feet. Three humps of my shoulders, and off she goes. What makes it so dark?' "'The candlemen have all gone,' sighed Pompa, brushing his hand wearily across his forehead. "'All except that one.' In a distant corner sat Tommy Tallow, and the light from his head was the only light in the great chamber. He was reading a book with tin leaves, and looked up in surprise when he saw the elegant elephant and Pompadour approaching. Then he started to sputter and ran toward a bell-rope at the side of the chamber. "'Stop!' shouted Kabumpo, "'or I'll blow off your head!' At that the little candleman trembled so violently that his flame head almost went out. "'Now!' "'Suppose you show us the way out,' snapped the elegant elephant, stamping one big foot until the floor trembled. "'You could burn out,' gasped Tommy faintly. "'That's what we do.' "'Don't say out,' whispered Pompa anxiously. "'We want to go away from here,' he explained earnestly. "'Back on the top of the ground, you know.' "'Oh,' whistled Tommy Tallow, his face lighting up. "'That's easy. This way, please.' He almost ran to a big door at one side of the room, and tugging it open, waved them through. Goodbye, he called, slamming the door quickly behind them. Kabumpo and the prince found themselves in a wide, dim hallway. It slanted up gradually, and there were tall candle guards stationed about a hundred yards apart all of the way. Are you going to a birthday party or a wedding? asked the first guard as they passed him. Wedding, sniffed Kabumpo. Why? Well, "'Hardly any of the candles go out of here unless they're needed for a birthday or a wedding,' explained the guard, shifting his big feet. "'You're mighty poorly made, though. What kind of candles do you call yourselves?' "'Roman. 
chuckled Kabumpo with a wink. We roam around, he added ponderously. Do all the candles used above ground come from here? asked Pompa curiously. Certainly, replied the guard. All candles come from Illumi, and they don't like to leave either, because as soon as they strike the upper air, they shrink down to ordinary cake and candlestick size. Distressing, isn't it? I suppose it must be, smiled Pompadour. Goodbye, the guard touched his flame hat, and Kabumpo quickened his pace. I want air, rumbled the great elephant, panting along as fast as he could go. I've seen and felt about all I care to see and feel of the Illumi nation. So have I, the Prince of Pumperdink touched his scorched locks and sighed deeply. I'm afraid Ozma will never marry me now, and Pumperdink will disappear forever. Don't be a gooch, snapped the elegant elephant shortly. Our adventures have only begun. They passed the rest of the guards without further conversation, and after about two hours came to the end of the long tiled passageway and stepped upon firm ground again. Kabumpo was terribly out of breath, for the whole way had been uphill. For a full minute he stood sniffing the fresh night air. Then, turning around, he looked for the opening through which they had come. Not a sign of the passage anywhere. "'That's curious,' puffed the elegant elephant. "'But never mind. We don't want to go back anyway.' "'I should say not,' gasped the prince wearily. "'Where are we now, Gabumpo? "'Still in the Gillikin country, I think, but headed in the right direction. "'All we have to do is keep going south,' said the elegant elephant cheerfully. "'But we've had nothing to eat since morning,' objected Pompadour. "'That's so,' agreed Kabumpo, scratching his head thoughtfully, "'and not a house in sight.' "'But I smell something cooking,' insisted the prince, sniffing hungrily. "'So do I,' said the elegant elephant, lifting his trunk. "'And it smells like soup. "'Let's follow our noses, Pompa, my boy.' "'Yours is the longest,' laughed the prince, "'as Kabumpo swung him upon the elephant's back. "'So, guided by the fragrant whiffs that came floating toward them, "'Kabumpo set out through the trees. End of section 11 Recording by Pam Castile